thought leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for joining me for the next episode in our year-end toolkit series, a series of episodes designed to help you through the year-end close. And even if you're not currently in year-end, don't change the channel. This information is relevant no matter when your year-end occurs, and some of this advice may even help you get ahead in your process. Today's topic, materiality, and how to think through and manage out-of-period adjustments. Well, there's no new guidance, this has been an area of SCC focus this year, and it's always helpful to walk through the principles and some examples. This is an important and popular topic. Our discussion of this topic in January 2022 was our second most popular podcast of the year, topped only by cash flows. So you definitely don't want to miss today. Uh, an acknowledgement of the stress that these situations can cause, an acknowledgement that we think that the economic environment that we're in, in the regulatory environment, the risk of fraud, has made it even more challenging. The callback rule. So all these things that have been the additive are not making it any easier, but I think acknowledgement of that and a plan to deal with that is, is really important. That's my guest, Mike Mullen, a PwC partner in our national office, who joined me right before the holiday season. Mike shares his ex expertise managing materiality judgments and provides insights into recent SEC activity on materiality you won't want to miss. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Mike, welcome back to the podcast. So nice to have you on. And we're back talking about the same topic we talked about last year. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. It was one of our most popular episodes the last year, but it's dealing with SAB 99 errors and the like. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. It's great to be back. I enjoyed doing the, the, the podcast last year. And you're right. I think we, we, you know, talked a little bit more about what we talked about last year, but there's a, there's a fair amount new as well. So I thought it might be helpful to just kind of hit some of the key topics we might have talked about last year and then maybe get into some of the new things. Yeah. And we'll definitely put a, a link to last year's recording in the show notes because it's worth listening to because actually the guidance hasn't changed. So I was expecting you to be telling me, oh, so we can just kind of chat about the same stuff. And for you to say it's a lot different is very interesting. However, just to level set, make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Why don't it would be helpful, I think, to provide a refresher for our listeners on, you know, the principles of SAB 99. Well, or maybe even its purpose. We have some even students listening. So like a, 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 take a big step back and what's its purpose and then what are its principles? Sure. So SAB 99 kind of establishes a framework for evaluating materiality. And why that's important is because financial statements need to be free of material misstatement. So it deals with how do you evaluate materiality? And then when, when you have, may have an error, how do you kind of evaluate the error and how do you record it or treat it? So the basic premise is that for a reasonable investor who might find something important, would, could influence their decision, that that piece of information would be material. So that's kind of a, a, a definitional thing. Um, what the SEC says is there's no formula to determine it. So it's not like you do a calculation and say this is material or not. It's both a quantitative and qualitative assessment. Um, we do have some definitional help from this a Supreme Court ruling around that reasonable investor materiality. But and over time, you know, frameworks kind of developed as to how clients uh, and registrants evaluate materiality and how auditors think about it. So we have that to go on. There's an instructive example in SAB 99 about how to, how to do the evaluation. So that's also, also helpful. And with the practice that's evolved, there's certain benchmarks that have been established on the quantitative side. So for, for a normal profit company with like kind of, a, or I'd say kind of a normal operations, the 5% of pre-tax income is one of those thresholds. That doesn't mean it's the only threshold that makes sense for a company. And there's others that may be more relevant or as relevant. So you, you need to consider that and, and do the math around that. But then probably a lot more of the judgment comes in in the qualitative assessment. And that's where judgment is key. And judgment does not mean free license to decide, you know, in a, in a biased way that something's not material, which might be a predisposition for, for, for a, a restaurant to make. It means to be thoughtfully assess it, consider all the factors that an investor may, and then come to a conclusion after you consider the quantitative and qualitative. 
All right. And I think I'll get to this later because it's a question I have. We'll see if it comes up naturally. But I think in particular, uh, the qualitative is the hard part. And so definitely have some follow-up questions. But let me start with something that happened last year, actually almost right after we released our podcast. And that was that Paul Muncher released a statement on materiality coming from the SEC. So can you kind of share what was in that and, and maybe what that's impacted? Yeah, so I held my breath a little bit when he when he came out with something to make sure to go back to our podcast transcript and <laughs> right. say, did I say anything differently? And I was pleased to see that pretty consistent messaging, but important messaging. And uh, this was from, as you said, it was a March 9th speech. And for, he noted a few things that I think are really important and instructive for, for all of us. One is he noted a trend that in the past 10 years, there had been significantly less restatements of financial statements versus revisions. And I'll probably need to describe that a little bit more. So a restatement would result when the determination has been an error is material and the financial statements need to be restated versus a revision is when there are errors have been de detected, but they're evaluated. They're not material to any given year, um, but it made the accumulation of the, that error might be too big to book in a current year. Or a, or a company may just decide to go back and fix an error that wasn't material. Those are revisions. And the big difference is in the restatement, you're pulling reliance on the, on the financial statements, and that has all kinds of implications, right, that we can think about. Versus a revision is, by definition, it's deemed to be not material, but we're just kind of fixing the record. And so um, the inference behind just noticing that there's been a lot more revisions versus restatements is, you know, the question is, are clients and auditors making the right judgments. Although I guess the other inference could be that financial reporting is getting better. And I think it's probably that has a, a big input into that. I think that is what we like to believe. And I think there are enough metrics out there that I think from Sarbanes-Oxley mm -hmm. onwards that internal controls have been improved, company's financial reporting has been improved, and audit quality I think has improved over that same time. So I, I do believe that. And I think that is one of the, one of the reasons and that will is what we would point to. But also I do think that there, you know, there are tough judgments to be yes. made. And that's where I, I think it was just, it wasn't, uh, I, I don't know if it was a warning sign. It was yes. just, hey, let's be cognizant mm -hmm. of this and make sure we're making the right judgments. So that was one thing. And kind of on that same point, he said, look, um, the idea is not to discover an error and then try to create an argument of why it's not material. Mm -hmm. It's to really approach it as objectively and unbiased as you can he notes it's not a mechanical exercise. Um, it certainly shouldn't be just based on the math. But when you're bringing in those qualitative measures, you really have to be honest. And that's important for the company. It's important for their audit committee. And it's important for the auditors. And it's maybe a little bit easier for an auditor to be unbiased, right? I mean, that's part of our, mm -hmm. our job. So that's part of the value we would bring to that exercise. But that warning and that reminder is out there for the companies, too. Um, so objectivity no matter what the implications are. So we do know that restatements have implications, right? They can result, and we're, I think Heather, one of the new things we'll talk about is clawbacks. Mm -hmm. Clawbacks of executive compensation, it could result in reputational harm, uh, it can infect share price, and, and additional scrutiny by investors or regulators. But what Paul is saying is you can't use those implications to then make an argument, you know, to avoid that mm -hmm. conclusion. Those factors actually make it more likely that something would be material. So that was that was important, um, unbiased, and uh, you know, good judgment. He also, what I thought was really helpful was was actually he used some examples of of what what I'll call the examples of losing arguments, things that they've seen, and frankly I've seen mm -hmm. uh, you know, arguments made to to support why something's not material. And one thing he pointed to was that qualitative factors cannot be used to offset something that's quantitatively you know, sig you know, really significant. So if something, as I said, there's these benchmarks that may be established or in a particular case, uh, a, a company and their auditors comes up with a, with a materiality, a number that makes sense in their circumstances. Well, if you have errors that are above that, it's kind of hard to argue that qualitatively there's reasons to bring that back and make it not material. He also said the, the inverse. Mm -hmm. uh, something may be not quantitatively material, but if it's it, it, not quantitatively significant, but it's qualitative factors lead to believe that it could be material, even if the number is below, you know, a threshold you might think about. So it, it kind of works both ways and, and it's important to think about it. So that's why I hesitated when I said, I didn't mean to say quantitatively material. 
it's, you don't determine materiality until you consider both the quantitative and the qualitative. So let me ask you a question because you made the point early in, in what were you just you were just talking about that it's finding error is not sort of an exercise and then figuring out why it's okay. And I think that's very difficult not to do because particularly depending where you are in your reporting cycle and you know we're going to be releasing this not in November but in January and you know sometimes things are easier for your own company to be dealing with them in November. So how do you kind of separate that human nature of justification from this exercise? It's it's difficult. We, we do it. I mean w the way we really do it is through through education uh, for we, what we recommend, and we talked about a little bit this last year, is a company to have a, a good, solid process, have the right people involved, and uh, spend some time before you're in that year-end crisis situation to have a thoughtful assessment of materiality and, and document it as such. And the better you do that, it becomes actually a little more clear when there is an error mm -hmm. versus coming up with an error and then trying to uh, make an argument. What we've seen and which doesn't really work too well is to create a different story when you have the mm -hmm. error versus the things that you said were key metrics uh, and, and analysis prior to an error, right? So we look for consistency in that. Of course, as auditors, we have a lot of practice in reviewing um, and, and commenting and, and helping companies conclude on SAB 99. So with that experience comes the ability to, you know, to offer that guidance. But for those who don't have that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 that's what we kind of recommend, uh, you know, a bit of a practice to have the right people involved, have a good process. One of the things that it's hard to do is demonstrate good judgment when you're under the gun uh, and timing. And we'll talk about a little bit later, um, one of the things I want to mention, which was new, was some enforcement activity this year surrounding a SAB 99 experience where the time pressures maybe w was one of the things that negatively impacted um, how it was done. Oh, it's interesting. I interviewed Tim Carey for the podcast and he was talking about, we, you know, we talked about not wanting to look at your shoes and taking pride in your work. And my guess is when we get to that, there's going to be some element of the, the that people may have had to be looking at their, their shoes, but specific to your point about deciding what's material before the error. Now, depending when people are listening to this, because I think some of our podcast listeners are just in time. So, oh, I'm dealing Perfect. with something. I'm, I'm going to listen. Uh, so it may be too late depending on when they're listening, but I, I do think it's helpful even, okay, now you had an error, but then next year you can get ahead of it or for the next year you can get ahead of it in terms of good practices. And this is, was not a specific podcast on defining materiality, but companies that do this well, what are some of the things, obviously it's written down, Yes, uh, but what are some of the other things that go into it? The, the people involved and otherwise. Yeah, one of the key things is when people again when we go back to the definition about what, who are we thinking about? We're thinking about a reasonable investor. Where I've seen it work really well is it's a very consistent, collaborative approach at a company, and so the investor relations folks, the treasury people who deal with investors all the time, the, the, you know how the company presents themselves in, to the analysts when you look at their press releases. The, the best are when it's consistent and there's uh, the metrics that the company believes are important to investors and the way they present themselves to the market is consistent with their materiality evaluation. You look for assertions that are being made that are supported. So when an assertion is being made in a SAB 99 analysis, that this is a key metric and this is important, the most important thing to an investor, to have that supported mm -hmm. by the actual documentation and the experience with the investor community, I think is really helpful. Now, Again, you have to be careful. There's this is always grounded in the gap financial statements. Mm -hmm. After all, um, what we're talking about is whether those gap financial statements are materially misstated. So you do have some clients where non-gap information may be a very key metric, and and there's a lot of non-gap information presented to investors, and it's very important. But you cannot. Another losing argument is to say that gap is not important. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> So sometimes that's a, a difficult discussion to have uh, with the company because they, they truly believe that, you know, the market's not going to move on this historical, mm -hmm. you know, accounting information that it's more forward looking, that these are the key metrics. And all that may be true and part of the story, but that's where you could get back to what, what are we really looking at here? And that's the gap financial statements. So you can never get too divorced from that. And, and I actually challenge 
uh, when, when people say that, that it's not important, the gap financial, I think they always are important. And the SEC has uh, consistently established that as well. Well, and that on that point, uh, and I've mentioned this on a few other podcasts in sort of this January series, I had Hillary Eastman on who did our 2022 Global Investor Survey. And one of the questions and things they were talking about was where investors get their information about risks and uncertainties facing the company. And the gap financial statements, I I think this is a little gratifying for people in finance reporting, were the number one place. But you know, more than 75% of investors are looking to those gap financial statements. So I just think a premise of the gap financial statements not being important is it's hard to make when you think about how investors really are using that information. I would agree. And for all of us who who spend so much time in this world, I think we're <laughs> we're grateful that that some People believe, many people believe it's very important exactly. to, the, to the capital markets. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. All right. So then, Mike, going back then to the SEC and to Muncher, I know that he has made other statements that are, I'll say, related to this topic. And specifically, he has made some statements to auditors, um, including one in October on the impact of fraud on investors. So anything on that, because I think many of our listeners may have said, oh, that's for the auditors. I don't need to pay attention. However, I think anything impacting the auditors always comes back around to the clients. So what would you say about that one? Yeah, I think it was a really important speech. And again, very consistent with what we've been seeing in the practice. And and to step back, what we're seeing is an environment that I don't think many of us have seen before, very challenging. The economic environment has been very difficult with inflation, higher interest rates, supply chain you know, issues, human labor issues. And then you have a regulatory environment, mm-hmm. which has gotten pretty, pretty difficult. And then all the geopolitical uncertainty. We think it's a very challenging environment that many of our management teams and many of our engagement teams haven't really experienced in this way before. And with that, we have tied... Uh, a higher risk of fraud to that. And this was the message that that, that Paul Munter was, was making as well. This current environment, uh, the belief and the thesis is that that would increase the risk of fraud. And that's because of all the pressure on companies with reduced profitability facing some of these challenges. So he did focus on the auditors and where his focus was there is, hey, we're the gatekeepers. And mm-hmm. that's a term you hear a lot now. And we have to accept that professional responsibility and expectation. That's been a recurring theme. We play a key role in identifying where there may be a possibility of fraud and ensuring that we're fulfilling our professional responsibilities. And I think for companies as well to be alert to the higher risk of fraud in this environment. And the risk of fraud, of course, from a financial reporting standpoint, brings in the risk of you know, intentional uh, you know, bookkeeping, things like revenue recognition, you know, revenue brought forward or reserves being reduced, things that... Um, We've seen experience in the past, and that can be a response to companies struggling to make, you know, an earnings estimate, for example. So in that space of, of increased risk, the risk of both fraud but by error, intentionally or not, increases. And so we need to be thinking about that. And one of the points that I made last year, and it gets to this qualitative point, is a very significantly, you know, small dollar amount, if it's intentionally done can be material by, by definition. And there's cases to support that. Um, and uh, oftentimes it's just a little bit of an adjustment that maybe again helps somebody make a number or make a debt covenant. Um, and so the message is we all as, as CPAs, professionals need to be skeptical. He used a very interesting term and you know, he said, trust but verify is the way some people think about these things. <clears throat> he said, that's not the right approach. And that doesn't sound unreasonable, right? Yeah, trust but verify. Exactly. Uh, the problem is he says that almost, that that assumes that there's trust and oh. integrity there. He said, you know, and uh, you're the auditor, you actually, you can't assume that. So you should approach it, you know, even, I don't know if distrust is the right word, but you need to be, you know, skeptical. be very skeptical, I think is the right word. We're seeing this also play out in, the whistleblower hotline activity. And so, you know, there's a fraud risk there. What I, what my experience has been in the detection risk is, is almost a hundred percent because there are a lot of um, folks who this, the culture has changed a bit. There's incentives from the SEC for whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. There's just a different mindset. And so, um, and, and the, and the information is, is more readily available, you know, throughout organizations and, and otherwise. So, 
we're seeing a huge increase in a whistleblower hotline. And a lot of times those whistleblower hotlines have to do with financial reporting and, and potential you know, allegations about potential improprieties. So it's a reminder for us all to be vigilant in that area. I think that was that was Paul's message. And, and frankly, that's been our message to, to, to our practice. Well, so two follow up questions for you. And you started it with your last statement. Should companies expect to see anything different from their auditors because of these, I'll call it reminders coming from Munter and, and maybe not just from that, but you know, is there, is there, are there differences because of the current environment or otherwise for this year end? I think they, they should expect it. And where, where it really demonstrates itself is in, if an auditor is doing a proper risk assessment, this risk of fraud should be one of the things that is evaluated brainstormed around, mm -hmm. and there should be some responsive audit procedures uh, to that. As well as a company should have, from an internal control standpoint, they should also be doing a thorough risk assessment, acknowledge the risk of fraud, and have the appropriate internal controls in place, uh, have the appropriate whistleblower hotlines, and very importantly, and often underrated, appropriate tone at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's critical, and we've seen that play out where there's the right tone at the top, uh, employees feel that they're encouraged to, if they see something, to say something. Mm -hmm. um, where we've seen environments that don't have such a healthy tone at the top, that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, employees are hesitant to uh, to bring up bad news, and sometimes that leads to some you know unfortunate behavior. Well, and I think your point on the risk assessment is, is interesting. It goes with sort of a theme we've been talking about here on the podcast about the, the tendency to carry things forward. There's, we all have so much to do and there's this temptation of like, it was well done before, it's, it must still be good. But I think in the current environment, your risk assessment in particular and your fraud risk assessment for both management and the auditors is not really something you, I mean, it's a starting point, but you really need to be able to step back and look at the new factors. It, exactly. It's not a check the box exercise. It's gotta be real. It's gotta be done with the right level of judgment. Uh, with the right folks involved. And as you said, the environment is different. And so th those things we do believe um, increase that risk. And um, so the, the response should be different from a prior year, for example. Right. And then I think the other point you, you hit on a bit, but I said at the beginning of asking about this, that often things that are director of the auditors, companies see come around to them. But I actually think, and you made this point, this is bigger than that from a company point of view, because this is also a reminder for companies that management and the audit committee and others involved should be looking for these red flags, contradictory information, whistleblowers and otherwise. And so I'm sure you have some perspective on that too. Yes. And, and we've gained a lot of perspective from that, from where there's been um, allegations and investigations that are done. And what we found in some cases is that um, the, the, the whistleblower activity is not being dealt with on a timely basis. Uh, the right folks, like we've had audit committees who weren't being, you know, all the information they should have had to assess that wasn't wasn't being done. Um, oftentimes, there's uh, it, it depends who's responsible in, in companies. So sometimes there's a lack of accountability. Um, so we, we've seen um, we've seen where it doesn't work too well. Um, but again, where there's the right tone, where there's good audit committee, where there's a good audit committee charter, good audit committee involvement. Uh, independent reporting to the audit committee. Those are all characteristics that help uh, improve that situation and and usually have a better, you know, better outcome. So Mike, let me go then into kind of talking about the impact of all this. And you started saying the impact of this one particular thing, the, the comments directed to the auditor, but more broadly, what are we starting to see in practice coming from the SEC in the area of dealing with SAB 99 fraud or otherwise? First of all, just from an enforcement standpoint in general, uh, it's pretty pretty active SEC enforcement um, under this administration. So, you know, there's been about a 10 percent increase in the number of filed enforcement actions in, in the last year. The money that the that the SEC actions have resulted in in terms of fines has has nearly doubled from the prior year. Um, and as I said, this whistleblower award program is alive and working. Um, and both in the, you know the number of people that have been awarded. And, and the total dollar values at all times high, all time highs. So it's being promoted mm -hmm. and it's being utilized. So we know, and and from the tone coming out of the SEC, uh, they they believe enforcement tools are really important to drive accountability. So they're going to be very active in that way. So that 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 should be an alert for for everyone just to be aware of that. 
And then we look at some of the enforcement actions, and I'll talk about one in particular that happened to be against another another firm, and and the and the company, the registrant was also subject uh, just for their for their financial reporting, but it, it has to do specifically with a with a SAB ninety nine oh. analysis. So okay. it's, it's directly on point. Yeah. So, um, and I think there's some lessons learned here. So what the SEC found in this case was that the SAB 99 analysis itself was faulty. It was not complete. It was inaccurate. Um, and we, we delve into that a little bit further. And the record that's presented in the enforcement action is that it was um, something that was done under the gun, right? So there was a late error found. And so you can, you know, enforcement and the, and the lawyers will look at a timeline and you can see here, this was a very, I would say rushed to ju- rush to judgment under probably, and we all have been there with filing deadlines yes. and pressure from a client or wherever it may be. Um, so as a result of that, the analysis was kind of sloppy. I, I, I would say um, it had, you know, the numbers didn't quite add up. Um, so even the percentages from a quantitative standpoint um, weren't accurate. And when, when redone appropriately, it was actually quantitatively much more significant. And again, this is one of these where the qualitative arguments were kind of inconsistent. They contradicted some documentation that had already been um, created around what was material and what mm. wasn't, right? And so you have one of those situations where uh, the company was trying to make an argument. And uh, unfortunately, the audit firm um, didn't use that objectivity we talked about and didn't take the time to make sure the quality of the analysis was what it should have been. So we, we, we you know, you, you look at a lack of objectivity, you look at insufficient documentation and documentation is something we talked about a lot last year on the podcast, yeah. how, how important it is. Um, and the analysis performed, um, you know, to support assertions that were being made. And, and what eventually was found out was some of the assertions being made weren't, weren't supported, right? They weren't factual. So it was a very unfortunate um, situation. Um, but you know the lessons you stand back from that as, as, as a practitioner and and, and as a, as a, somebody who has a team that uh, that reviews these seven yes. nines is to make sure that we have the right supervision and review in place um, to make the tough judgments and tough calls. Sometimes you have to say, for everyone concerned, uh, look, we, we need more time. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't have all the facts. We don't have all the facts. Together, collectively, we should you know, take the time that's necessary to get that and make sure we're making the right judgment. I don't think the audit committee in this particular case was brought in on a timely basis and had all the information. So that relationship between the audit committee and the management team and between the auditor and the audit committee um, wasn't um, where we would like to see it, right? So so there's definitely lessons to be learned here. Um, but the bottom line is there, you know, that, and, and in this particular case, the other thing that was really interesting was, who was subject to the enforcement action from the audit firm. It was the partner and the director on the mm-hmm. account, which you would expect, but it was also the consultant, the person maybe oh. in my role at, at that firm who had, you know, who had a consultation requirement. So they were consulting with the team and signing off on this analysis. So, you know, the re- professional responsibility is, is one that's really important. So we've taken that as a, you know, a, a very clear message. Um, and, um, you know, again, try to make sure that everybody l- learns some lessons from these situations. So Mike, let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions. Cause I do think tough situations, many, or I'd say vast majority do not come to something like this, but you know, we know just from experience in the next two months and upcoming year, there are going to be controllers and CFOs and auditors and people like you dealing with these tough situations where there's not enough time, there's a lot of pressure, someone has this expectation or that expectation. And so, you know, I I understand you said in this particular case, the consultant got charged too, but I think in general, from an audit partner point of view, they have someone like you who's helping them. But if you're the controller, how do you have, I'm going to use this word courage how do you have the courage to say, we need more time? We can't get this done because there can be sometimes unrelenting pressure to get it done. Yeah, there's a lot, lot of pressure. Um, but that's where, again, a good, strong management team with a good tone at the top, with a really uh, effective audit committee um, are the important characteristics we look for. And look, we see it all the time. Uh, companies, management teams have to make tough decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do. In, ge- in, in general. So uh, it does take courage and it, and it takes, um, it takes the right mindset and, and the discipline to do it. Um, and I, you know, it's, we always say it's, you know, 
the cover up is is worse than the crime, right? It's just you just have to deal with these situations and deal with them appropriately. And um, you know that that's that's the best advice I can give there. And I, you know, and this is probably a good time to bring up this proposed clawback rule mm-hmm. because th- so so the clawback rule is the SEC is having the the listing you know the, the, the listing agencies establish these rules that are basically going to say if there's a restatement or a uh, revision of financial statements that companies have to have uh, executive clawback. So if those errors had not been made um, in those prior years, if there would have been an effect on the executive compensation, that there has to be you know uh, a clawback of that. You can imagine. Now, that same controller you were just talking about mm-hmm. who realizes, oh, my gosh, there's an error here. And if, if I have to deal with this as a, as a correction of an error, uh, my CEO is right. out of the money taken out of their pocket. I mean, that's a, obviously a serious thing with serious implications. I think the the goal of the rule is clear and it's accountability. And I think we would all support accountability. Um, I, I worry a little bit just about the, the addition. Again, it's just the additional pressure that's going to be put on 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 everyone involved mm-hmm. in the process because of. The implications. Mm-hmm. But if we go back, we talked about this earlier, just because there's significant implications, actually, that's an argument for why it is more material. Right. 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 And so it's this like circular logic. I mean, one of the qualitative points specifically uh, pointed out in SAB 99 before these clawback rules existed was, does it affect executive compensation? Mm-hmm. Well, now mm-hmm. we know, in fact, it, it will, will and does. Yes. And so, again, I think we can support the, the, the conceptual theory behind the, the clawbacks and, 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 and the fairness and accountability points. And I just think we all have to also recognize that it puts that much more pressure, um, that, that, that much more you know, implication to the to process. And so does it affect the judgments that are being made? And that's where, again, gonna come back. despite that, we've got to make sure we have sound, unbiased, objective um, conclusions being made. And I think that's going to be really important. Yeah. So I have some quick hit questions for you, uh, most of which I think are things we talked about last year, but I think are worth repeating, even if someone listens to our podcast from last year. So let's, let's run through this. And then I may think of a few more based on what you say. So first one role of the audit committee, when you are taking a step back and saying how the audit committee can help, how do you think about that? Um, <clears> they <throat> can help by being really engaged in the, in the process. The best situations we see is where there's really good communication. Communication is really key. Uh, an auditor understands they report to the audit committee when the audit committee understands they have that responsibility. And uh, when there's a good uh, rapport with management and a good understanding about mutual expectations and responsibilities and where that's set out and the right that then you start to build those trusted relationships, mm-hmm. not that we're not going to you know, tr- trust, but verify. We talk about, but yeah. you do, you do develop trusted relationships with an audit committee and, and that's important. And so th- those audit committees that, that, kind of follow that process and are, are, are involved and realize they have that responsibility. Um, it, it helps with the objectivity a little bit. Because again, the management team, you know, you, you're talking to the controller who maybe that was his team maybe who made an right, error. Right, right. That's hard. And we all get that. So I think uh, one step removed sometimes. And we see the same, you know, uh, and that's why we have consultation requirements in these cases to assist our engagement partners mm-hmm. in, 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 in making those judgments and in, in bringing our experience that we have in many of these situations where an engagement partner maybe just faces this, you know, one time a right. year, we have a team that can help them. And um, so it all like kind of works in coordination. And I, I think, Mike, the other point here would be that someone listening, whether they're an audit committee member or management or the partner may be thinking, but we don't have those relationships and it's sort of never too late to start, you know, and, and just because you don't have it now doesn't mean it, that can't change. Even if maybe you are listening to this just, just in time, but even if you're dealing with an error, working on relationships as part of that actually can be helpful. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's key to the, to, to, to the business and, you know, and, and it's usually through really effective communication and that's, um, you know, there are, as we know, there are a number of things that need to be reported to the audit committee, and we have to make sure we're doing that in an effective way. So that could be written communications. That's in audit committee meetings. But I think there's also, in the in the best cases, there's a there's a ongoing dialogue um, as issues arise, so that um, that relationship is built over time, and there's a, a clear expectations uh, both ways. And when the, when the going gets tough, it's really important to have have that. Um, we see that in these. Difficult, uh, whether it's a difficult SAB 99 decision, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, there's a whistleblower and there's an investigation that needs to be done. Um, I'm sure we've had podcasts on that topic. Um, 
the the audit committee and and them effectively um, fulfilling their responsibilities key to those situations. All right. So second question, qualitative analysis. And you made this point earlier that that is sort of key to this whole thing. And this may be a hard question and for our listeners, I'm putting Mike on the spot, but is there one or two points with the qualitative analysis where you kind of tend to see maybe go wrong or a little off, off the, the direct path and maybe people don't deal with as head on as, as we might like to see? Yeah. Generally, um, we, we see a little bit of this in um, failure to look at the, the, the trends and the and and kind of the analytics breaking you know disaggregation sometimes sometimes you know not looking at um, again consistent with you know how the segments are presented how th- things might impact th- th- different segments um, we see it a little bit in in a lack of consideration of was there any intentionality was there a whether it's a, a, a you know could be a debt covenant mm-hmm. you know a calculation uh, could be an earnings uh, estimate. Uh, it's it's not it's not looking at how things have been presented to the market and then consistently looking at that effect of the error and whether that had an impact there. Sometimes that's not done as effectively as as you as you'd want, and um, and therefore um, it's not adequately considered. All right, good area of focus, and then sort of I guess related almost to what the point you just made quantitative analysis. I know from my own experience reviewing these, preparing these, being involved with the client on these, um, that can, it can get messy very fast and they can be difficult to do, particularly if you're dealing with multiple smaller items. So again, advice on dealing with the quantitative analysis or maybe places where people tend to uh, go off well, the first thing is the less errors you have, the easier yes, that quantitative is. So that's an important point. point. The ones that controls. get controls. Really, yes, controls uh, are, are critically important. Um, and we talked a lot about the, you know, the whole control evaluation needs to be done. But on the numbers, yeah. So obviously just, you know, it's pretty basic, but the, the, the less errors you have, uh, the easier the analysis. Also, what's really important here is when there are a number of errors, you have to look at each individually mm-hmm. and in the aggregate. So sometimes what happens is kind of a running tally. Yes. Well, the net effect's not that much. Uh-huh. That's not the way. And specifically, 799 says you need to look at it individually in the aggregate. So that's one uh, key point that needs to be made. And sometimes we, we miss that. And um, also, there's uh, obviously a focus on the income statement. But you, you do need to look at the other statements, uh, the balance sheet, the cash flow. And you say, well, how can something be material to the balance sheet? Well, it could be a, a gross up situation. Again, it could be a situation that affects a debt covenant. Sometimes there's balance sheet metrics. And similarly with cash flows, um, that's an important standard, important uh, statement you know, with gap requirements. And, and sometimes people are a little cavalier uh, uh, about that. And we've seen in practice and through mediation with the SEC that, no, um, you have to assess materiality in the cash flow statement as well and disclosures. And it can be very important disclosures mm-hmm. that it's misstated. So, so it's comprehensive is the other thing I would say that, that is another key point. That we've yeah. I, I like the fact your last two answers basically could be summarized with be thorough. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Like there's no, there's really, this is not a place for a shortcut. Right. And, and again, and we say what's the best part of the process and we're, we're actually, if you do a thorough analysis and have really good documentation, you're, 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 you're much better positioned in when in the, in the SEC will often as, as is their uh, prerogative to, to question these cases. So if they see a, uh, an error being reported, but there's not a restatement, they might say, well, you, you've, you've disclosed it. You don't believe is material. Well, show us your documentation and a more thorough um, and, you know, contemporaneously prepared documentation. That's, that's well supported. Um, that's objective. Um, that's going to, you know, that will win the day. Yes. Right? Versus something that's even, and, if, and, and you could actually do yourself damage. I mean, something that maybe arguably wasn't material. If you don't do a very good job of explaining that, you, you might not. Uh, it could be hurtful. The, yeah. All right. Next one, private companies. So we're talking here about SEC rules and SEC statements and otherwise. But I know from personal experience, we tend to apply this same framework when we're dealing with private companies. So what advice do you have to private companies in terms of how they're thinking about errors? Yeah, it's, it's, I think very appropriate for them to be thinking in a, in a very similar fashion, because again, the, the, um, yes, these are, this is a SAV 99 we're talking about. So it's an SEC rule, but the auditing standards require mm-hmm. consideration materiality. 
preparer of financial statements have to have to declare that they're free of material misstatements. So I think we have a useful framework here to apply. So I would say very little difference in that. Obviously, there's not quarterly reporting, so that further complexities and some of the other public reporting requirements that come with this. Um, and of course, the clawback rules mm-hmm. won't, wouldn't apply and things like that. But you have just like, you know, those, those private financial statements being prepared for users and mm-hmm. they have that same reliability question. And um, so I would say it's I would use this very same same mindset and um, and and try to you know learn from what the public companies have learned and, and, and apply it in, in your way. Obviously, uh, materiality could be viewed a little differently mm-hmm. in that environment, but that's that should be supported by your you know, by the facts and circumstances for those clients. You know, it's interesting, Mike, listening to you, it's almost what you're saying is don't view this as a burden because I think people do view this as a burden just across the board, but it's actually a tool to help think things through and particularly for private companies because, you know, you don't have the same exact requirements, but it truly is intended as a tool to work through an error. I think so. And it also, I think, helps set, set the plow at the right depth in terms of where your controls should be. Mm-hmm. And, and a realization for what's important to your investors, private or public, and making sure that you're delivering to them reliable financial information, right, which is, you know, a clear goal. So I think it can be helpful. And as I said, the practice that's developed over time um, could give you some useful tools and templates to employ you know, when you're doing that. All right. A few more. So emotion. And we spent a lot of time talking about this last year and we touched on it earlier. So, uh, you know, we don't have to delve too deeply, but I think inevitably SAB 99's emotion gets involved or errors. I should just say dealing with errors in the financial statements, because to your point, it could be the people who made the error who are having to do the evaluation, or it could be you feel like you got stuck with someone else's error and it's not fair. You know, there's so many different uh, aspects to this. So how, what, again, is your advice to people to take a step back from all that emotion? Yeah, it's hard. <clears throat> um, so I think recognizing that it's hard is, 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 is the first thing that it, that it will, that will put pressures on, mm-hmm. on relationships and, 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 and on timelines. Um, but um, often, you know, sometimes you have to, to, to think through, like, you might have a time, is it really a timeline, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just stepping back and saying, hey, the key thing is getting this done, done correctly. Um, we, we call it kind of effective issues management. Um, and again, our best, best advice in these cases is to have those procedures in place before there is the crisis. So, um, and this is an example where we kind of walk through, we suggest the team sit down with the management team, with the audit committee and say, hey, Here's the way this process would work. Here's, you know, here's who should be involved. Here's what you should be documenting. Here are the considerations so that everybody kind of, again, has an agreed, um, you know, kind of uh, game plan Mm -hmm. or or toolbox to to work from. We think that helps um, because, again, at the end of the day, particularly with, you know, with the auditor involved, you're, you're, you know, it can be painful. um, But I think if you're going to, you know, collaborate, do it the right way, you can get usually a a better outcome on a more timely basis. Um, and so, uh, part of it's just, uh, you know, real, first of all, setting the right, you know, as we talked about before, the right internal controls, uh, go a long way. And that's, that's one been the interesting thing that's developed kind of post SAB 99, right? We talked about SAB 99 from end of the 1999 and then Sarbanes-Oxley <laughs> came in, as you know, and the, the work that companies have done to improve their internal controls, um, has reduced, you know, the number of errors that are being found in financial statements. We know the restatements are a lot lower than they used to be. Um, and the revisions and things. So I think all that audit quality we talked about, all the improvements have been made, you know, to rely upon. But then when you do have an error, just, you know, have a process in place to be ready to deal with it and have the right communication and protocols. All right. So one more question, and then I'm going to ask you for your final takeaways. So f- one of the things we talk about a lot here on the podcast keeps coming up is people are talking about guidance. They often recommend read the guidance. And so I guess I have sort of a two part, you can pick, answer both or, or either is if you're dealing with the SAB 99, how much do you sort of emphasize telling people to go read it? And then how often do you yourself kind of go back to that, that written guidance? I have it right here in my pile. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. And that was not that. even a setup. <clears throat> I did not know he had it and he right. does. And I don't carry it around all the time. So don't think <laughs> too poorly of me. Uh, but no, I, I, I do think the gu- it is helpful refresher to go back occasionally to the guidance and, and read it. I do think for, for, you know, anybody's getting into the financial reporting for, for, you know, for the first time, or you just take an audit committee role. I think it is important because it does spell out again, um, 
some of the key reminders mm-hmm. has, and, and it, and, and again, it takes you from that people hear, um, the total mix information, what a reasonable investor would think important. And they, they think they have a lot of latitude. I think reading 79, 99 brings you right back down to the reality. No, it's, 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 I wouldn't say it's prescriptive, but it's, it's pretty pointed on what considerations you need to go through. And I, I think it's pretty logical. And so I do find it helpful to, to you know, kind of, you know, buy into the guidance. And it's interesting because often the other party that we haven't talked about gets involved is SEC counsel. Oh, yes. Um, and they often have views on materiality and they, you know, and, and again, um, they can add a lot of value to the process because they understand, you know, the securities laws, they understand uh, management's responsibilities, public reporting and all that. So they can be very helpful. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what the company needs to understand is that that attorney's giving them advice. They're still responsible, and we, the auditors, responsible. It's 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 our opinion. So at the end of the day, it's going to be the auditor and the audit committee and management team make the decisions. But the SEC counsel, uh, good informed SEC counsel, can be very valuable to the to the process. All right, that's a, a great reminder. So then, final question. It's kind of open ended. Any final advice that you would have uh, for our listeners as they sort of look ahead to hopefully not having any errors to deal with, but you know things happen. I might be repetitive here, but objectivity and unbiased assessments really important. Um, considering, as we said, both quantitative and qualitative, um, have a focus on any intentionality. That, that's critically important. Um, the quality of the documentation and the analysis is really important. You don't want loose ends. Um, think about that sometimes these things will play out over time with an SEC comment letter. Um, it could be a year later. It could be an investigation um, to have that documentation in place. So that's going to be the record. Not all the, the discussions you had, what is on that, on that piece of paper. So the documentation is important. Um, having the right, we talked about the right process, having the right people involved and as timely basis as possible. Uh, an acknowledgement of the stress that these situations can cause, an acknowledgement that we think that the economic environment that we're in and the regulatory environment, the risk of fraud, it's made it even more challenging, the callback rule. So all these things that have been the additive Mm -hmm. uh, are not making it any easier, but I think acknowledgement of that and a plan to deal with that is is really important. And um, and then, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, these situations require really clear communication and, and, and I would say cooperation between all parties. Ah, excellent reminder to end on. So Mike, it's always such a pleasure to see you and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Heather. Pleasure. And that's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.